There is a 68 trillion, that's with a T, trillion dollar bank crisis that is still out there. I want to explain this to you today because a lot of people see SVB, oh, that's been handled. They look at Credit Suisse, oh, that's been handled. And they simply move on with their lives. Look, everything happens so rapidly. The news cycle moves so quickly. You can't keep up even if you try. So most people, they ignore it all and they simply look at what's happening in the stock market as a barometer of what's actually going on in the economy. And it couldn't be further from reality. In this video, I'm going to show you the truth. Interested? Let's go. You can see it right here. Lyft says it will cut more than a thousand people in new round of layoffs. Reductions will affect 26% of the company's employees. Tyson Foods to eliminate 10% of corporate jobs, 15% of senior leaders. And you have, in the case of this, one of the biggest companies out there, Samsung, talking about their semiconductors and why literally down 95%. 95%, you can see in the middle paragraph, the world's biggest me memory chip maker said operating profit fell for the January to March quarter down 95%. This is huge. It is the lowest profit for any quarter in 14 years. So when I tell you that this problem is something that is persistent, it's semiconductors, it's affecting, in the case here, Lyft, it's affecting you know, basically all different types of companies. Their profits are down because inflation is up, as well as a slowing economy. People are concerned, businesses are worried, and we can see commercial real estate and the effects that it has there, all linked to interest rates. But there's another thing that's been linked to interest rates as well, and I want to show you that here and now. Banking problems may be the tip of the debt iceberg. Shadow banks have grown rapidly and like banks are exposed to risk from higher interest rates. This was, by the way, what Janet Yellen was talking about not that long ago. I brought it to you here on the channel. The biggest question facing the economy lately has been how bad will the banking turmoil be? Though two US banks failed a month ago and a third is still struggling, emergency lending by the Fed seems to have prevented broader harm. And we know that the Fed stepped in, they provided liquidity, and everybody was kind of pacified by that. But of course, there's more to it. You can't just sweep everything under the rug. That's what the money and GPS is here for, right? Well, that's what I'm here to do is uncover the truth. You could see the next question should be, will it spread to beyond the banks? That's because SVB, it touched off this bout of turmoil. It was a symptom, not a cause, of a broader force at work in the financial system. You see, SVB's core problem was that it owned a lot of government debt funded by unstable deposits. Because suddenly people start going to the exit, well, then that company has a problem. Fractional reserve banking, right? As interest rates rose sharply last year, the mark-to-market -market value of that debt plummeted, and deposits became more expensive and scarcer. A lot of banks own similarly devalued bonds, but that is just the tip of a debt iceberg. You see, since the end of 2009, total debt owed by governments, businesses, and households has risen 90% to $68 trillion directly from the Federal Reserve. We've got big numbers, $68 trillion. Does that mean suddenly everything's going to collapse? $68 trillion just gets wiped out? No, come on. But stick with me here. We got to realize that this is significant. This is huge. That's going on. And it explains it right here in this a really good Wall Street Journal article. And understand that I've been covering this and perhaps like a link to it at the end of this video in, in simple language, what this all means. Since early last year, interest rates have risen at the fastest pace since the 1980s. When interest rates go up, the value of an existing loan or bond goes down. This isn't always apparent. Lenders don't typically work mark-to-market loans, sometimes bonds, in their earnings statements. But regardless... The economic reality is that those bonds and loans are worth a lot less than when they were issued, and someone has to bear those losses. This is the quote here, huge. That's going to show up somewhere in the system. Understand that SVB is not the only one. There are many other banks that just haven't come to the surface yet. And so that's why you're here. You're trying to figure out, well, what's the next bank? Well, we had talked about Deutsche Bank, and suddenly those credit default swaps, those bets essentially that the, you know, this particular company or whatever it might be is going to start going, you know, belly up. They want insurance against that failure. Well, that was one of them. Same thing happened with all these other banks. 
but that was calmed down by essentially a huge injection of cash into the system. So there's more to it, and I just want to cover it just really briefly. Banks are the most visible debt holders, but collectively just as much debt is held by pension and mutual funds, private uh, credit funds, life insurers, business development companies, hedge funds, and other non-banks, or as they are sometimes called, shadow banks. Whether it's banks or non-banks, they face the same risks. I'd caution against putting all the focus on banks. You see? And that's why, even though we have our differences, as a love-hate relationship with Janet Yellen, she did make a good point that we can't just look at the banks because the non-banks, they're basically doing the same thing. Okay, Banks are important because they may have deposits. That's kind of the difference. But look, if they're not going to be segregating your, you know, your funds, well, then that's a problem, regardless if it's a non-bank or bank. Your funds, your secured investments should always be secured, even if that company topples over. That's what you would think anyway, but it's not the case. And we've got trillions upon trillions of dollars that are at risk. Okay, very important stuff. Let me show you something. Diversification is key, and alternatives specifically have been seeing huge growth. Goldman Sachs and BlackRock said in September that the days of Tina, there is no alternative, are over. Even though stocks rebounded to start the year, BlackRock is reportedly avoiding the 60-40 allocation. RIA reports 88% of surveyed advisors intend to increase their allocations to alternatives over the next two years, with over half, 52.6%, raising allocations all the way up to 15%. Institutions already, quote, max out at 30 to 50% into alts. With a weakening US dollar, traders have roughly doubled their short position since mid-March, according to the Financial Times. One alternative has seen amazing numbers, even in 2022, fine art. 2022 was the best auction year ever, highest total from the big three auction houses, nearly $18 billion. The last time inflation was this high, contemporary art appreciated an average of 20% per year from the Masterworks Index. Contemporary art average annual appreciation is 13.8% also from the Masterworks Index. It's pretty incredible to learn, and it's why I'm excited to partner with Masterworks. Masterworks has been written about in the Wall Street Journal, Business Insider, and the Financial Times, among others. They offer paintings from legendary artists like Picasso, Monet, Banksy, each offering qualified with the SEC and broken into shares. When one resells, you get a slice of the potential profits. All of Masterworks' 13 exits have been profitable to investors. In all of their exits to date, Masterworks has delivered positive net returns to their investors. This is how in 2022, they paid out over $25 million in total to their investors. Feel free to offer any thoughts on the platform. Masterworks has nearly 700,000 members and paint things have sold out in minutes. To keep up with the demand, they release new offerings on the platform regularly, and you can get priority access at the link in the description. And that brings me to this. The latest GDP numbers have economists fearing more than just a recession. The U.S. might well be facing stagflation. That's what they're worried about. A lot of the data is pointing at in that direction. You could see manufacturing index out of the Fed, Kansas City Fed, and you look at this, look what's happened. Of course, this has come down uh, quite a bit here over the last little while, along with, guess what? What happened with the you know increasing interest rates? They happened to mirror each other because that's around the time that business sentiment started turning downward. You're looking at the jobless claims also rising. Now, it's still fairly low compared to what we've seen in some dramatic times, but this is still something that we should be aware of. Continuing claims is consistent with a recession. So what they're saying is while it's off from, you know, as I said, from the, the peaks, it's still at the level that is concerning, at least to some. Investors favor currencies that can offer both an ongoing domestic tightening cycle and still some room for a hawkish surprise at the coming meetings. In that sense, the euro is one of the very few currencies that can offer this combination at the moment. You look at Europe, you look at what's happening in the United States, you look at Singapore, you look at Switzerland, you look at all these different places, different currencies, a lot of stuff is happening at the exact same time. And one of those factors is what's going on 
with the currencies uh, in relation to the, the financial system. The difficulty right now is trying to understand the value of a US dollar in relation to other currencies. Because as an investor, I could be parking my money or I can be investing in other companies that are generating a lot of their revenue, their sales in Europe, for instance, or I could do that in Asia. But what's going on here, a lot of this is really um, misallocation of capital because we've seen so much money going into the wrong places, ending up in the wrong hands. And that's never a good thing because it usually results in some turmoil and then things rebalance. So right now there's too much money invested in US tech stocks. There's a few, a handful of names that are just overwhelmingly um, you know, taken above the majority. And I worry about that because it's not a good sign. It doesn't show us that there's strength there. Look at this. This is talking about the, you know, the reserve currency, why they're using it and so on. And I think it's important to note. For instance, you buy goods from Rwanda. It is highly likely that your pounds would be first converted into dollars before conversion into Rwandan francs. There is a little to no liquidity in pounds to francs, but there's plenty of it in pounds to dollars and dollars to francs. And so I just want to explain the fact that when you see this, the way it works, the US economy could be in a weakened state, but the demand for that US dollar can still remain strong. And that's why. Okay. So that's me trying to bring this together. Okay. You can look at this and understand that the US has a very strong monopoly. And this is just one example of how we see that and why that is. But that's changing. It's taking time. Of course, they, they show you right here in this uh, example. You know, you could see it. This is all the different currencies, uh, US dollar, Euro, Yen, Pound and Yuan. And overwhelmingly, the US is, you know, being used more than more than the rest. And that's the reason the liquidity is a factor. UK inflationary pressures rise with gain in business confidence. I don't know where that confidence is coming from, but hey, why not? OK, so these are the things that are going on right now. You've got the economic contraction. At the same time, you look at the strength of the US dollar. Where do you park your money? You've got to look at all these factors. So important, but don't give up and understand that you can empower yourself to get the knowledge you need so that you can make the right decisions for yourself. I'll see you tomorrow. Take care.